I'm not just writing history. I am making it. I have the brain of a historian and the clapback of a comedian. You better come with sources because I always check footnotes. Hello, welcome to another episode of Historians on Housewives. I'm here with Jessica. Hey everybody, it's Dr. J. Mill, the millionaires. And Max. Hello. And today we're going to talk to Dr. Jennifer Edwards. And Jessica actually knows Jennifer Edwards from a long time ago. Well, I didn't realize I knew Jennifer Edwards when we started to get um, suggestions um, about medieval history and housewives and how they intersected. It wasn't until I realized she went to the University of Illinois I know this young woman. She was a graduate student when I was a, a new assistant professor at the University of Illinois. She worked with Megan McLaughlin, and she also worked on the Journal of Women's History. So it's just funny that we'd find ourselves now in conversation as Bravo Demics, if you will. And she is a big time Bravo Demic. She is like an encyclopedia in some in some cases for Bravo. So it's going to be a great conversation. So Jennifer is a associate professor and chair of the history department at Manhattan College in the Bronx, where she teaches courses in medieval and ancient history, and she's raising her two young sons there. She earned her BA at the University of Massachusetts and her MA PhD at the University of Illinois. Her work focuses on the histories of women and gender, power and authority, saints, monasticism, religion, and healing during the European Middle Ages. Her book, Superior Women, Medieval Female Authority in Poitiers Abbey of Saint Croix, came out with Oxford University Press just in July of 2019. This book demonstrates that abbesses claimed extensive monastic authority throughout the entire medieval period, claims that male officials supported vigorously. The abbey was founded by St. Radegund, a 6th century queen of Francia, which became France. Although Radigan joined the monastery, she named another nun, Agnes, abbess. Both Agnes and the famous Italian poet, Venatius Fortunatus, who spent a great deal of time in Poitiers, called Radigan mother, the head of the spiritual family. Welcome, Jennifer Edwards. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really thrilled that you all have started this project, and I really look forward to future episodes and all the work that you're doing. We were so excited when you wrote to us, and we thought, oh my goodness, there's someone working on medieval history who sees all these connections that I always just wished were there for everybody. <laughs> it really does feel like many different parts of my life are coming together right now. <laughs> so would you like to share your housewife tagline with everybody? So it was tough for me to choose one, but I think my favorite, which I really do see as kind of a, a later season tagline, but my favorite that I would use is, you're going to have to work to pass this Gen Ed, and that's Gen Ed with a J. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so to just jump right in to our Bravo addiction, can you tell us about your favorite Bravo liberties and why they make your list of favorites? Sure. So I really like the women who are vulnerable and emotional, who feel a little bit more real, even though I think there are a lot of people who don't necessarily agree they're real. And I feel like I'm exposing myself to name Bethany Frankel because she is such a controversial person and does try to produce. But I feel like she just puts it all out there that we've seen her, you know, at the top of the Wheel of Fortune, at the bottom of the Wheel of Fortune and her personal life. Um, that she has this really fractured relationship with her mother that I find super fascinating. Um, so Bethany Frankel is definitely uh, one of my most, uh, the person I find really most fascinating. And for similar reasons, Catherine Dennis, who's also been super controversial, but I think is a queen. Um, and just the real life drama, I think, really raised the stakes. Um, I know it's not Real Housewives, but uh, a Bravo celebrity um, on Southern Charm, that the real life drama and just the way that she 
made Southern charm change from the intended Southern gentleman to becoming to become this show where there are so many women who are kind of at the center and the men are getting pushed to the outside because the women are so, so much more interesting and open and honest about the lives that they're, they're um, living. And then also I really love Padma um, Lakshmi um, more for her memoir than for what happens on the show. Um, because in her memoir, she, you know, she really had this fascinating life, um, married to Salman Rushdie and everything. Um, but also was open about the medical issues that she was experiencing and the ways that they affected her life um, and her fertility and the real life pain that she was going through. And then the activism that she's begun on. And we don't see any of that on the show. Um, but she was also open about her imposter syndrome, which I do think you can see on the show where she doesn't feel like she's not a classically trained chef. So when she's sitting with people like Tom Colicchio, she is really nervous. Um, but I don't think that necessarily comes through unless you're really looking for it. So I found that, you know, that they're willing to kind of open themselves up and be nakedly vulnerable on the show. I, I really appreciate. Well, and I think that imposter syndrome is something that a lot of people can relate to, kind of regardless Absolutely. of what their profession is. I feel like we all sometimes struggle with that. Absolutely. Right. I, I don't think our students would would understand or have any idea that right before you go onto the stage to do that big lecture, you're thinking, who am I? What am I doing? Am I <laughs> supposed to be here? <laughs> yes. So, Jennifer, how did you come to Bravo and how does Bravo shape your life as a Bravo Demic? That's that's our term for academics like yourself who like Bravo. I absolutely love the term. That's amazing. I'm going to use that all the time now. Um, so I was in my later years as, as a graduate student when Bravo switched their programming around. Um, I was back from research and writing up in 2003 when I think Queer Eye started. So I came to it right away. Um, and then as the dissertation writing dragged on and on and on, I started watching more and more TV, especially I think as friends started graduating and getting jobs and moving away and I was there on the prairie and I was really locked in that dissertating world and needed a kind of more frivolous outlet and that's what Bravo seemed like. So I really started with um, uh, Real Housewives of Orange County and Project Runway and Top Chef and Queer Eye right from the start. Um, and I was just captivated by women like um, Joe. I like felt some urgency that Joe needed to get away from Slade. And all women need to get away from Slade. All women. <laughs> yes, yes. And, like I felt some real anxiety for her, and she kept coming back. And when she was back on season two, I was like, "What are you doing here?" Um, and then, um, you know, Bethany, I found really fascinating. Um, so I think I came to it from this idea of this needed needing something frivolous to relax my brain. But like any regular academic, that brain doesn't ever really turn off. And so then I started spending far too much time analyzing them and I think that they started to bleed into my teaching and I started using the housewives when I'm talking about like Roman sumptuary laws and how the Romans <laughs> felt that you couldn't have um that you couldn't have uh, appropriate femininity if you were wearing furs and gold and jewelry and like here are women wearing twenty five thousand dollar sunglasses and I just I couldn't I couldn't turn away once I really started. Um, and I have even asked a job candidate from another department whether or not he watched Top Chef to kind of determine whether he would fit our campus culture. And he did watch Top Chef and he was hired and he does fit right in. I absolutely love this. So when Casey and I have gone to conferences in the past, we've used Bravo as an icebreaker. So I was wondering for you um, and your colleagues at conferences, um, if you guys do similar things if you could share some of those experiences with us so i love that you're so out in the open with your bravo love like i have been much more in the closet i think in the guilt guilty pleasure realm for a long time until i um and and similar to, to graduate school i feel like the conference going experience changes once you become a professor and um so many people are no longer going to the same conferences. So, for example, the major conference I go to is the International Medieval Congress at, there's 
two. There's one in Leeds and there's one in Kalamazoo, and they have very similar names. So I'm thinking of the Kalamazoo one. It's the International Congress on Medieval Studies, ICMS in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And as a graduate student, we used to go in big gaggles together. And then as we became professors or people left the profession, I was more and more going and knowing fewer people or we weren't going to the same sessions. So I was moving so, more alone and so more meeting new people. And one of the places I kind of put myself out there was I went to one of the Society for Medieval Feminist Scholarship Dinners. It was a big dinner of 40 or 50 feminists who are medievalists. And um, this is a con- conference on medieval studies, not just medieval history. So there's 4,000 people there. Um, so it, it can be intimidating. And I sat down at the end of the table um, next to a younger professor I didn't know, across from an older professor I didn't know. Um, and we're just talking awkwardly about who we are. And at some point, somebody made an oblique reference to a housewife. And I feel like my antenna shot up like I meerkatted at the table. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that the older professor across the table from me was the was Sally Livingston, the professor of the society, the, the president of the society at the time. And the woman next to me was in her first or second year of a new position. I don't want to out her. I don't know what her staff stands on as being a bravo demic, but um, she's amazing. And we just spent two hours. You know, people were leaving the dinner and we're just still talking about um, these shows and about um, our, our experience with harassment and ideas about race in these programs. And I feel like it went on and on and on. And, and it kind of moves in and out of our own experiences and the housewives as a text to communicate and build identity. And it turns out that I then, I learned so much about this younger woman's work that I then, because I became chair of my department, I invited her to give a pretty prestigious lecture on my campus, and her book is out. She came and she taught one of my classes, and my students have who have since graduated have written me about excitement that her book was out, that they found out on their own. Um, so, I mean, it's just been uh, that moment, I think, right then encouraged me to at least open the door <laughs> of the closet and say, this is something that I find valuable and that I can approach as a, an academic in an intellectual way um, and that I can also find connection with my personal life and, hey, do you do the same thing? But I feel like I want people to kind of give me a sign <laughs> yeah, <laughs> before it, I openly <laughs> disclose. For historians on Housewives, there is no closets. There are no shame. Like we are claiming this in the light, very proud of being full people with regular lives that do regular things and, and have a regular I love career. It. I will say that when I was in graduate school, the great Deborah Gray White gave a lecture at, um, I think it was a luncheon. Anyway, she gave a lecture and she said, you must have a hobby. Whatever you do in grad school, whatever you do in the profession, you must have a hobby. And I have to tell you, for 20 years, I haven't had a hobby. I haven't known what I was doing. What is a hobby? Is watching TV a hobby? I didn't know it could turn into a podcast. So I feel like now I have both an outlet and a quote unquote hobby, which is, you know, I guess that still isn't the right term for the academy, but I'm, I'm happy to say that all my TV watching has finally paid off. That's great. And I would say that at my actual institution, there is no cost. Everybody here knows that I'm the housewife person because I keep making this pitch of how it, it's so much more than what people think it is. People think it's just this uh, group of socialite bickering, but it, there's so much more to it. Yeah. And so, okay. So on this theme of the way that you see it so relevant in various ways, you study the history of medieval Europe, but you still see so much resonance between medieval Europe and what you watch on Bravo. So can you share kind of these connections that you've been seeing through the years of Bravo watching and even now in 2019? Well, I I think there's just so many uh, spaces where I could say that one, one, I can't tell them a character, one of these housewives story arc will remind me of something that I've seen or read or for example the the um, scenes of them packing for a trip or getting which I love I could watch that all day um, or them getting ready for a party those just vibrate with a traditional kind of arming of the hero 
seen in medieval literature. Um, and there's absolutely a similarity between Erica Jane and her glam squad and seeing someone like Lancelot, you know, get the armor buckled on and the helmet and preparing the sword. And they are both going into battle <laughs> once they are prepared. I love uh, this because their dinner parties are like going into battle. It is. They are. They are. Or even... Um, I was thinking about Beowulf, and uh, I don't know how familiar all y'all, y'all were are with Beowulf, yes. but there's three there's three monster scenes, three major battles in Beowulf, and in the first one, Beowulf is armed. He fights Grendel Nate, like without any armor. I don't remember if he's completely nude, but he at least has no he has no protection and he has no weapon. He's fighting with his own brute strength, and I feel like there are moments when people are, you know, maybe the morning after in that French chalet when they're not fully in their makeup and fully in their clothes or Erica Jane eating a pie at a campsite for I'm breakfast. Proud of it. I'm proud of it. has no problem eating it. <laughs> and they're just they're just, you know, they're they're fighting in a different way and that they're they're stripping down. Um, I, I was trying to make something of that too. So I just feel like there's these massive number this massive number of characters and these persistent themes. Um, they just remind me of a story cycle, like a Robin Hood cycle or a King Arthur cycle, um, where there's all these different characters who kind of come in and do similar things. So you'll have, you know, the, the um, in a King Arthur story, you have the um, love relationship between Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot. And you see that then in like a Tristan and Isolde story um, with Mark and Tristan and Isolde. Uh, But you see those kinds of persistent ideas of, oh, we're going to go on a trip and we're going to have no drama and we're all going to come together. There's just these same kind of set pieces that you drop in across the different franchises with just a little bit of different tweaks. So these um, socialites who are consuming and traveling and having parties and bickering remind me of, you know, the feasting and the going on a uh, crusade or on a grail quest or something and having different adventures play out as they go there. Um, but there's also, I think, some resonance for me that's a little bit more behind the scenes. Um, and I didn't talk about this before, but um, I don't know if you're aware, Medieval Studies has been going through a serious crisis over the last three or four years about race and gender and inclusion. Um, that's both about who makes up the the scholar, who, who's doing the scholarship and whether what's called medievalists of color, medievalists of color are really included in syllabi and conferences and, and such, but also the way we look at the medieval period. I, I know I was certainly trained to think about medieval Europe as very white space, and it absolutely was not. Um, and it's really about the way you tell the story and the way you frame it. And um, medievalists of color have really urged um, medievalists to think more about Europe and medieval Europe as not being only white and to think about diversity there. And that has attracted, that has become such a serious fight across conferences and blogs and journals that Milo Yiannopoulos, has uh, uh, been attracted to this. And he wrote a long form essay about the dispute that he's now publishing as a little book that he is attacking some prominent medievalists um, who are urging us to reevaluate these ideas. And so that reminds me of these shows that are, you know, you've got shows uh, set in New York City where everybody on it is white, which is not New York City, um, where everybody is this hat. And that really doesn't reflect the society itself. So some of that behind the scenes drama that's going on in my my part of the profession reminds me of some of the, the ways that Andy Cohen and the other producers are shaping these shows in some problematic ways. Yeah, and almost the New York cast now, well, really, the New York cast always, it's almost in some ways resonant of Friends from the 90s. Yeah. You know, or, like, the, they have one coffee shop and they're, everyone in New York is just super white. <laughs> Everybody's at the Regency and only people at the Regency can get in the door right, and can no get their in, apple. No one in their New York takes the train. If they do, it's, 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 it's an excursion into, you know, uncharted territory. They don't even take cabs. Yeah, they don't even take cabs. Or the subway. What do you think is uh, when they went to to the Bronx, when they went to Little Italy, it was like they'd been to a foreign land. Right. Oh, and I lived even, in the Bronx. Even, um, Car- was it Carol wore the safari outfit? Right, Remember that right. they made fun of her? No way. Well, and they all thought they were like having this mafia meal. I, I think it was at, um, at 089. I forget the, I, I'm terrible with, I, uh, 
Anyway, the restaurant they went to is a pretty famous kind of standard restaurant, and they were acting as if like it was super mobbed up because it was Little Italy. <laughs> I have a question. So this might be <laughs> this might be you, you'll I don't know. So I when you're talking about your Grail stories and stuff, I tapped into this memory I have of a medieval history course I took and we read parts of all and I never forgot that woman who was just alone in the woods who had shut herself in that little hut yes could that be equivalent to the way that Shannon ghosted all the women in Orange County last year on vacation That's and was amazing. like and was just mourning her divorce and you know, hated everybody and was just like, I am, I'm going to lock myself here. I'm even changing rooms. You have no idea where I am, but you can find me in my not woods cabin. And I, I picture Shannon with her, her hair loose and matted and her like, well, she's beautiful without makeup, but you know, starting to look, you know, I feel like the, the idea of a woman in the woods is often she's coming a little witchy or a little, she's coming a little heretic or she's dangerous in some way. Usually. And, they, and the women were treating um, Shannon, Shannon like she was dangerous at that moment. But Shannon also has this interesting relationship with like non-Western medicine and kind of the holistic sort of stuff that, that like a woman in the woods is sometimes seen as maybe she's a midwife, maybe she is an herbalist. And so I think Shannon fits right into that and that people are really suspicious um like the inquisition often worked where like the inquisitors would come into town into the town square and they would say hey is anybody acting weird around here and the more integrated normalized people would be like well there's this weird woman who like doesn't put on any makeup makeup wouldn't be the issue they talk about but similar there's this woman down the end of town who's really weird and doesn't want to socialize with us and she's a problem and you know in, in um in france or germany or spain that woman could then be detained and tortured and asked questions um and often people will then admit to all sorts of things like dancing with devils and um and then accuse other people um of things and often the accusation would only be believed if the accused were was also a marginalized person so yeah absolutely i could i could talk about that all day that's awesome yeah i feel really bad that i don't remember the name of that no, I don't woman either. in parts of all but yeah I just, I've never forgotten that, that poor woman in the woods. <laughs> I want to title the show now, Shannon in the Woods. In the woods. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering if someone came to an academic conference, a history conference in particular, and started looking around to say who's acting weird or who's acting strange. Like, would we all be gathered up? I mean, <laughs> because we're like oh, but... little silos and we are a little weird, like yeah. the weird. Um, yeah, I think that they're, that the historians are in their silos, but they are in, they're so clicky. I feel like academics are super clicky and we're click, quick to point out who's not in our clique. Right. And we're going to start doing that with Bravo Demix because we want to be where we're safe. So speaking of history, so historians work with sources, as you know. So can you tell us a little bit about the sources that you use and how how the disputes left behind in fragmentary records in some ways resembles the drama we're used to seeing on Bravo. Oh, there's so much there. Um, so my, I just finished my first book. It just came out um, this summer. Um, and it's about the Monastery of saint Croix in um, Poitiers, which is uh, central Western France, which I, I always flash to the Naomi Lacroix, or LaCroix issue on Southern Charm, where La they, they say the water LaCroix in Wisconsin, but she wants it to be LaCroix. <laughs> um, anyway, so I, with the sources I had for this medieval monastery, um, mostly those sources were generated out of moments of conflict. And frustratingly, they are written by men who are typically responding to the women who wrote them. So the nuns that I study, they do keep some documents that they wrote themselves, but they're mostly copies of letters like these. Um, they didn't keep copies of the letters they sent. They kept copies of the letters they received, or the documents I have are very long lists of receipts. So so-and-so paid a certain amount of money for this certain rent on the certain day. Or so-and-so joined the monastery, and they gave this kind of donation. But the really rich sources that give a lot of information are almost always written by the king 
well, not him personally, but his notary and the Pope or a local bishop responding to the nuns who are complaining that they have a right, a privilege that is not being observed. And they want the king or the bishop or the Pope or whoever to come and enforce the privilege that they have. Um, so the, the letters will um, reprise the complaint that the, the nuns have written, but they're not quoting them. And so I, I very rarely have the real words of the women I'm studying. And that's super frustrating. Um, also, I only have moments where uh, there's a problem, right? Um, they're not complaining if everything is going well. Right, so I feel like crisis. it's really... Right. I, I feel like it's really easy to overrepresent moments where there's problems when my book covers 900 years of this Abbey's history and they're not complaining every year. They're not complaining every month over this period. They're complaining in like these, these flashes where I, I can use those flashes to get a sense of how things have changed and how things have developed, why they're making this complaint about the same issue. Um, in a different way, maybe 300 years later than the one they made before. Um, I have five election conflicts uh, where the election has gone, the election of a new abbot has gone horribly awry. Um, and two of those cases, you know, there were armed men in the monastery, like petitioning for different issues. Um, try, in one case, campaigning for their sister to be elected. Um, but that's not what happened every time there was an election. There's a lot of peaceful turnover, uh, and I don't really get to see that. Um, the only, you know, if, if it was a peaceful election, really the only uh, evidence I would have of that is that now a new abbess is collecting the rent, or a new abbess is making a donation someplace else. And that gives us the sense that the old abbess is gone, but we don't know why. Is it because she died? Is it because she was displaced? Um, it's not always clear. So I feel like I focus on conflict a lot. Um, I'm a very um, comfortable, I'm very comfortable with conflict myself. I, I joke that I'm not passive aggressive, I'm aggressive aggressive. You're Although I don't company. think I would, You're a good <laughs> I don't know that I would want to be on any of these dinner parties. Um, but I do, I do find conflict interesting and fascinating. And I had defined this project before there was a housewife program. Um, so I feel like once those started, it was just a natural, um, it naturally pulled my eye. Um, but the conflict based fragmentary sources I have will tell me things about very wealthy women who were fighting, were fighting to protect their reputations and their community, who were very devoted to their families, who were very devoted to their faith. And I feel like that's so much of what the housewives are about. Um, does, and Does you know, Andy Cohen become the Pope in the housewives analogy? And then my other oh, question Jesus. is, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and is the Pope willing to issue letters on these fights because these women are wealthier nuns or would they would the pope have done this for just other monasteries too so this is a major anxiety of my book is that sanqua was a royal foundation the person who founded it was a queen who also became a saint and it was constantly protected by the kings of francia which then becomes france um so it is a super high status monastery and it had extensive property and Poitiers, which I, I know we don't really know much about that town now, but it was a very important town in the Middle Ages. So I feel like the king and the pope are inclined to be supportive of these women. And as time goes on, these women are their relatives or they're trying to place their relatives as the abbess of this monastery. And some of the conflict that happens is that the king is getting involved in trying to, to get his own sister or his own niece elected. Um, so... I have a lot of anxiety about how representative my book is, but what I try to suggest is that these were strategies that my nuns were using in order to claim authority, and they were successful. And they were successful in ways that didn't seem unusual to them. And so these are strategies that were open to other women. And by strategies, I mean, on the one hand, the women were constantly writing men and saying, hey, your predecessor supported me. You should support me, too. And the men were like, oh, of course, I support you. And the other strategy they used was um, more cultural. They had this, this very famous foundress 
And so they use images of her or stories of her or new stained glass of her um, to encourage new patrons. So when the King of France was distracted, um, they would then go to the Pope and say, um, you know, the king is to support us. Wouldn't you like to support us? And then when the Pope is no longer able to intervene in France, they go back to the king and say, hey, um, here's Radigan. Isn't she awesome? Um, she's very similar to your mother. Wouldn't you like to support us? And then that attracts the king. So this kind of the strategy was something that other monasteries certainly could do. And there were other royal foundations. There were other major abbeys like saint Croix that were able to to make these kinds of arguments. So it may not have been that every single monastery had this at their fingertips, but there certainly were many other monasteries that could act the way San Kwa did. So to what extent do you think you can um, liken everything you've just described? Uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about the drama about holding a peach or holding an orange. And in some ways you have to have someone from the outside, like I watch Wendy Williams, how are you doing? And she will always say, I think the next housewife should be X. And there's a few times that the next housewife has become so-and-so. I say this because, um, you know, there is some lobbying that has to happen in order for you to hold you know, the peach, the apple, whatever it is. Yeah, it's a system based on people vouching for people. Exactly. Like, I think Roni, the first season of Roni, and maybe into, like, the second and third season, were all friends of Jill Zarin. Like, right. that was the connective tissue. So here's my theory I haven't say, shared with Max or Casey, but thank you for providing the framework, um, Professor Edwards. So, you know, Vicky is now a friend of the show on Orange County. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, we all have watched the two episodes. We're two episodes in, not to date the podcast, but we're only two episodes in on um, Orange County. And it's lacking something. So in my mind, while I was doing the dishes, I thought to myself, self, and self said, huh? And um, I said, why would Vicky step aside? Of course, she gives the story that she's done this for the past, you know, a million years, and she didn't want to let her life op be open again. I'm going somewhere. So why would she step aside? And then when we were texting back and forth, we were talking about Brianna. Maybe Brianna needs to step up mm. and take an orange, right? Because that's what Casey said. And that would make sense why Vicky would stay would step aside, because Vicky is, does a lot of stuff for her kids. I can't imagine Vicky stepping aside for any other person. So I'm just wondering if, like, Vicky is now the retiring abbess, maybe, of Orange County. <laughs> just, that's a long way of saying I, I, I saw a hook. <laughs> so I don't, uh, I, I don't like Vicky. And I have never. Oh, I don't never, like her either. Let's be clear. But I, 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 I quit Housewives of Orange County. Let's see. I think I gave it two more seasons past the cancer thing. So I'm not sure. I think I sat out two seasons. You know, I've kept it. I've kept my oar in. I have listened to the podcast. I kind of know the the broad strokes, but I cannot watch her anymore. But I have to say, I still haven't come back to those two episodes because I just I feel like the I don't know. I, I would argue in favor of OC being canceled. It's just. They're all so awful, and they're all... <laughs> you know, I, I have really been struggling with Tamara for many seasons now because of the way that I feel like she's using an estranged child to remain relevant. So uncomfortable. And it, it makes me super uncomfortable to, to watch that dynamic play out. And th then also in the background you have, you know, she's now become born again, and so there's this religious threat. I mean, she's looking for storylines anywhere. But, yes, the, the, the child one is the most. Uh, that one's been really, really difficult. So just as a, as a viewer to want to wanna buy into these characters or, you know, have like there's like no sympathy. I feel like I can have because even when her oldest daughter has been like, OK, mom, let's try. Remember, I don't want to be on social media like I want to keep my life private and then. Tamara can't help herself but put it on social media and then her daughter's angry and like won't even return texts but you know then she wants to be like oh well I don't understand and and it it, it gets old and I feel I find myself really feeling for Tamara's daughter who really you know doesn't have a choice in the career that her mom wants to have or the way that her mom's career is also kind of contingent on this really rocky relationship. I feel like there's some real world stakes to OC 
um, both with Vicky and, and Brianna's house and um, that weird relationship with Ryan. Um, but uh, the, the, the Tamara and Sydney relationship, I just, I'm very uncomfortable with some of those relationships and I don't really want to support them um, being on television rather than trying to seek some healing there. Um, and I also don't think, I'm sorry, I don't think that Vicky would stand aside for even Brianna. Yeah, you know, Vicky's the person who gives you a car. Oh, that's she, she's Casey the person who gives you a though. car that you have to pay for. Yeah, okay. right. Or okay. that, like, that the home, but then the home that she was going to buy or did buy Brianna in Orange County to move her back from Oklahoma and needed tons of renovation. You know, it was like always like Vicky always is here's the present, but I just haven't dropped it yet. So you don't really know what the how catch the, is. yeah, like what the catch is. There's always there's always a lot of strings attached with Vicky. Sorry, Vicky. I feel like she's constantly Yes. I tried Vicky. I feel like she's constantly manipulating Brianna and coming between her and Ryan, who's also problematic, um, but then doesn't want to hear it when anybody has anything to say about her own relationship. Well, come on, her relationships. These are stand-up guys. I mean, how can you not rally around Brooks? <laughs> I mean, come on. Fun fact, Max and Brooks shared the same dentist. We did. When Vicky wow. paid to get his yeah. teeth fixed. Uh, it's really uncomfortable when you walk into your dentist's office and they have... Easily like an 11 by 18. I'm like trying to think of the dimensions. It was a really big picture of Brooks in wow. his um, new teeth smile. In with his new teeth smile right when you walk into the office. Did he sign it like a be the a D the celebrity should? I wish. I don't think I, it was signed. Yeah, I don't know how, and I don't know how many people going in there knew who he was or like how that affected my dentist's business. He ended up retiring. He was a weird guy. He used to put Fox news on in the, um, in the operate, whatever they call the debt, like the operating room. So like, like not only is it tortured. So you're not just hearing, you know, nineties radio, you're getting Fox news. (laughs) Yeah. You're getting, (laughs) it was when Glenn Beck was on. Oh my God. Oh boy. Laughing gas. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like a dentist in Southern California should have more success stories than Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> well, Max's teeth look nice. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about methods for centering women uh, in your scholarship when medieval Europe tended to be very patriarchal and misogynistic? Can I challenge the question? Um, so I, I definitely think that the Middle Ages were patriarchal, no question. Um, but we're still living in a patriarchy today. And I think we're really locked into this kind of, especially on TV, this heteronormative world in which men are expected to be fathers and to govern, um, you know, look at the makeup of our Congress. Um, and women are supposed to be mothers, even when they're working. They're supposed to, you know, I, I forget what the percentages are now, but that women are still taking on huge amounts of the the child care and taking care of the house. Um, and I love this book by Judith Bennett that's called History Matters, um, Patriarchy and the Challenge of Feminism. And it talks about what she calls patriarchal equilibrium, which is this idea that, yes, there's been many changes, and yes, women's lives have meaningfully improved, but that at our core, women's lives are still pretty consistent within a patriarchy. And the example she gives is that the, um, the wage gap in... The, uh, well, she wrote this book in 2007. So the wage gap at the end of the 20th century is exactly the same as the wage gap in the 12th century, um, which is really troubling. Um, so the Middle Ages were absolutely a patriarchy, but I would not necessarily say that they're misogynist. I think there are definitely anti-feminine moments and there are misogynist aspects, but I don't think that they experience a Oppression, that they would name it as oppressive, even if they had that language available to them. Um, and uh, I mean, I think that's a much larger conversation. I can get back to the actual question. Um, but I think like somebody like Catherine Dennis really shows us that um, women who seem like a side character, who are being slut shamed and gaslit and depicted as crazy and jealous and hysterical, um, if we look at them the right way, we can recenter their stories and um, just, you know, reading against the grain or between the lines, um, you can see 
that sources that are written entirely by men do have this influence from the women. Um, so for the, the sources that I was talking about before, you know, where we have these letters, um, and they're, they are written by men in response to women, um, you can sort of see how those change over time and see that the same issues are coming up and o- over and over and over again. And so for what I can see is that um, for one of the cases from my book, there is a, is a series of processions. Um, it's basically a parade on a holy day devoted to St. Radigan. And on this day, the women have the right to leave the monastery and go on procession to a neighboring church. And they are supposedly superior to the men, the priests, they're called canons, who um, run that church. And the canons are required to give up the great altar on that day and to allow the women into the choir where they have a mass said and the abbess gets to sit in the most prestigious seat, very housewives, she gets to sit in the most prestigious seat in that church choir. And one year, 1466, the men don't let them in. And they don't refuse to let them in. They don't say, you don't get access. What the men do is they... Um, they have a new organ, and so they say their morning prayers with the organ over and over and over again, and the organ has, like, all of these extra flourishes. So the women have left their monastery. They've processed. They're waiting in the churchyard for the men to to stop. Their, their, they don't want to interrupt the service. That would be rude. And so they politely kind of mill about, and the townspeople are all out watching this procession and watching these women stand in the sun in the churchyard waiting to get access to the church and the men drag on and on and on for hours until eventually the nuns are forced to just go home and give up. But they complain and they complain for six years about this. And it is such a major, I mean, it seems so small and petty, but it's such a major issue that they have the eyewitness testimony of 35 people in the case of, you know, saying, you know, this is something that the women have done for, for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years beyond living memory. And the witnesses all use that sort of language. Um, so I feel like uh, when I read the documents of that, the documents are all written by men. The interviews are all done by men. The men are writing those stories down, but they're trying to, to keep that language. And you can hear the nuns behind the scenes organizing the witnesses and kind of giving the, the witnesses the story of what to say. And eventually they win and the men are forced to give up and uh, to allow them access to the church and to give the abbess that seat. There's so much uh, in the Middle Ages about chairs that reminds me so much. What was it, the, the fight between Shannon, was it Shannon and Heather who fought about chair, uh, who sat in whose chair at dinner? Like somebody got up to go to the bathroom and they took the chair. Yeah, it was, it was Shannon's deal. first season. Right. Um, well, Radigan actually, somebody sits in Radigan's chair and she strikes them um, with some disease. And they can't get rid of the disease until they apologize. Um, this is after her death. Um, so, you know, this serious stuff about who gets to sit where. Um, I feel like if you look at those stories and you try to move them to kind of the center of the story that you're telling, it becomes less about, like, uh, maybe three generations ago, that kind of story would be about the institutions and the way the men are, you know, establishing power for the patriarchy and establishing, you know, control of the papacy over monasteries, where I see it as the women are working as partners with the men to be able to define what's acceptable in terms of office holding. And there's even a moment in that dispute where for centuries, the men they're fighting with, the canons, have um, always said, well, yes, sure, sure, the abbot is superior, the abbot is preeminent, but we think we should get paid more for the service that we're doing for them. So we acknowledge that they're more important than we are, that we are their dependents, but they owe us rent for this service or, or payment for the, that service, and that the, the money should go up. So they're, the men are even working within that system until suddenly this one dispute in 1456 about um, the processions and the access to the church, the men actually, in their testimony, it, once it's investigated, the men say it's against nature for men to be subject to women. And that's the first time they've said anything like that. So that gives me another little hint that something's changing here. Um, 
that they that there's something the the women uh, about the women as office holders that is unacceptable. That there's a female body in this preeminent position. That the men are seeing an opportunity, not because necessarily that they have you know these are these are neighbors within the church. They're priests and nuns. You know they are usually pretty brotherly and silly to one another. But here the men are really challenging even the idea that the women can have priority over them and trying to connect the um, misogynist or anti-feminine ideas there, not because they, and I, I really push anti-feminine over misogynist because these are women they love. These are women they, you know, perform the sacraments for on a weekly basis. They're, they're very connected to one another and they work together in Radigan's cult to attract pilgrims and patrons, etc. But, and, and the men are also responsible for taking care of the women's corpses after they die um, and honoring them. So it's very important, very close relationship. But they're seeking an opportunity here to kind of break away and be their own community. But what the abbess says in response is so brilliant. She said she accepts the position that women as women, they say it is against nature for women as women, uh, excuse me, it is against nature for men as men to be subject to women as women. But we don't claim authority over you as women. We claim authority over you as office holders. So in that way, I, I feel like women are upholding patriarchy and the women are indeed accepting the sort of anti-feminine position in which women don't have power in their own name, but that's irrelevant to the power an abbess can claim, which is so interesting to me because an abbess is by nature, a woman, but this abbess is able to kind of compartmentalize that identity and say, I have power because I am an office holder. And that's a position that the Pope and the King are absolutely willing to uphold. And they put aside that kind of anti-feminine position so that there's this kind of the abbess's two bodies, you know, that the body she has as a woman, which is irrelevant to her position as an office holder. How did that chair spread the disease? I'm sorry. Had, you said that you said that there was a chair, oh. the, the Radigan's chair, after she died, and someone sat in it, and they were diseased, and they had to like apologize before it went away. Yeah. So this is um, told in a miracle tale. Um, this is a you know this is an aspect of the cult of the saints where you have to um, sometimes be careful about the way you wear your historian hat. Um, so the story says that Radigan saw that somebody was sitting in her chair that should not be, and so Radigan struck them down. And this person experienced, you know, like, was flailing her limbs and was not in her right mind um, until she tries to apologize. And then Radigan erases the problem. A lot of saints do this. I think also St. April Frith has this moment where she, she punishes somebody for sitting in her chair. Um, but it's one of these, um, these hagiographical hey texts where um, you kind of have to accept the, the people are, who are, are are reading it and accepting it are devotees who believe in the magic that saints can work as conduits of God's holy power. Radigan does all kinds of things like that. She, uh, she weaves, she, she spins some thread and then a mouse comes along and bites the thread. So she strikes the mouse dead. So a lot of very small miracles there uh, where uh, when I look at the women being kind of petty with one another, I see some of that here. Um, and the nuns themselves can have these moments. There's a long dispute. Um, in the 6th century, in the generation after Radigan's death, where there's one woman who's been named Abbess, but she's kind of a, she's, we don't know much about her, um, but the women who are challenging her are both the daughters of kings. And they say that they should be Abbess, one of them should be Abbess, because they're princesses, and shouldn't, wouldn't you want a princess over this, whoever she is? And um, one of the things they complain about is that the nuns' bathrooms were under construction, and so the abbess, uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, the regular bathrooms, the latrines, were under construction, and so the nuns, the abbess, this abbess they were disputing, allowed women to come who were kind of servants, uh, allowed them to use the nuns' bathrooms. So we've got these lower class women in the higher status women's bathrooms, and they complain extensively about that to a panel, like seven, seven bishops. That's one of the major issues that they see as valid for, for ejecting a properly elected abbot. So there are all these moments like that where I feel like if you look at their stories that have been mined before, uh, to tell the stories of men. There's so much about women that is in there um, that we could just kind of push back on that frame of the story. And I, I think about Catherine Dennis a lot 
um, in that because, you know, Southern Charm was originally, Whitney designed it to be about Southern gentlemen and, you know, Shep and Thomas and, and JD and Craig and Whitney are all kind of the focus of the story. And you have this woman who's just kind of flying by a party um, who suddenly becomes the focus of the entire narrative. And then because of what's happening off screen becomes the focus. They, they sort of added her on in season two, right? It was Thomas and Catherine. She didn't even get to be just Catherine. Um, and then now it's really all about her. It's a much more interesting show now that it's all about her. Absolutely. So we're going to move into our Banco Party game break now. And the game that I designed today is named um, or is called Name That Food Fight. So I am going to give you guys a very vague synopsis of four different food fights um, that are coming from different housewife franchises. Now, I will I will give the vague synopsis or, you know, clue about this food fight your job is to figure out the franchise, the housewives involved, and if you know the season, that's great. Um, some of these have very iconic um, um, exclamations. So I'll give bonus points if you know um, the the famous line that goes to the food fight. Um, not all of them necessarily have one, but a couple of them do. So Jessica and Max are going to be writing down their responses so they can't be cheating. And um, <laughs> oh, we're still going to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when we go for answers, I'll start with you, Jennifer, and then we'll okay. move to Jessica and Max um, just so that your answer is also locked in. So everybody, everybody's checked then. Okay. My palms are sweaty. Excited. <laughs> okay. This dinner party saw part of a housewife hit the table before finding its way all the way to the floor. Saw part of a housewife hit the table? Yes. Before? I'll read again. This dinner party saw part of a housewife hit the table before finding its way to the floor. Oh, this is Aviva's leg. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You gotta, we gotta wait. They're still writing. Oh, shoot. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I can't remember her name. Thank you. I can't remember her name. <laughs> I have ladies' leg. <laughs> so, 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 so we'll let everybody like lock it in. But so, but there's still the, the season that you gotta know too. So, so remember, so, you get points if you know the, the main characters and part of this fight, if you know the franchise and the season. There is a line for this one. So, if you know the line, that went with it. That's a bonus point. Tell me when I can answer. Okay. Are you locked in, Jessica? Jennifer, whisper it to me. <laughs> <laughs> are you locked in, Max? Okay. You are up. Okay. So that's going to be season four of Real Housewives of New York. And Aviva throws her leg on the table. I don't remember the exact quote, but I know it was Carol was there and... Um, Ramona and Luann, um, I and Heather. Oh my gosh, Heather! Um, but there's something about is this fake? And she throws the leg, and it was at the Russian Tea Room, right? It was actually at Le Cirque. Le Cirque. Oh, Le Cirque. I failed my iconic New York. <laughs> and season. it was it was season six. Was, was it, it six? It was six. Mm-hmm. Was four Bethany's last? So it's the first one without Bethany. I thought so. It's, Aviva's on two seasons. Uh, yeah, Aviva was on. Two, it, Aviva was on multiple wow. seasons. So this was, I think, Aviva's last season. Oh, she left mid season though, right? I can't see her being on. Full, two I feel full like seasons. I feel like she was on. She made it. She made it. She was just kind of um, like there. Like there was a dispute whether or not she'd go on the vacation or whatever because she was afraid of flying. Right, so she got right. she got like, like really really boring and um, because she just was having trouble doing anything with the rest of the women. So she was kind of creating her own separate space. So this was her, this was uh, really at the end of season six of Roni. Wow. Uh, Max, did you get the line? Do you remember what she said? I I think Jennifer is close. Like, it's in that ballpark. I thought it was something like, you want this leg, take this leg or something. Like, it was something. <laughs> but I think you, you okay. were close. So to which the housewives this. are you saying this fight? Between? Oh, it was Aviva. I thought it was with Heather. 
actually. Because I remember being like, why are, why are we talking to Heather? Um, and what season did you write down? I wrote five. Oh, you were, you were close. Okay. Uh, still not the line. Okay. So I feel like we should retitle all the games Jessica doesn't know. Um, <laughs> I really thought I was a Bravo Demic, and then I sat at a table with um, these two and our guests. I, I'm far outpaced here. So I have written down, and Casey can see my chicken scratch, Lady's Leg, because I can remember <laughs> her name, in New York City. <laughs> and I also think she was fighting with Heather. That I do agree with. Okay. So I'll give you all two points on that. The line that Aviva is, like, yelling as she slams her leg on the table before she throws it, because she is fighting with Heather. Heather's accused her of being fake. And Aviva comes back and she screams, the only thing artificial or fake about me right. is this. And yes. then she slams it on the table and she throws it across the room. So it was like a melding of our two lines Yes, you guys together. were both, you were like circling it. Okay. I feel like I have failed myself because <laughs> I have used that gif of Aviva's leg on the ground so many times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This dinner party included a medium and a lot of e-cigarette smoking. This one I do know. Don't answer. I love this one. This is a this is an oldie but a goodie, I think. And if you if you remember what they called this episode, because I don't have an iconic oh. line, but if you remember the name of this episode, um, I will give a am, bonus point. I am ready when y'all are ready. Is Max locked in? I'm not locked in yet. I know. I, all right, I'll just. I'm gonna take a page out of Jessica's book. That no, I'm gonna write vague terms. Okay. Okay, go for it, Jennifer. Okay, so that's the dinner party from hell. Mm -hmm. um, I think season one of Beverly Hills. Yes. At Neil Grammer's house. Yes. And I forget her name, but she was the. Um, she was the medium from the show Medium um, that Patricia Arquette plays. Yeah, her um, name was Allison. That Allison was my Dubois. One I got. <laughs> that was the one answer I knew. I don't remember what they were fighting over. That was the one answer I had, Casey. And I would say there is an iconic line of "He will never fulfill you." Um, mm. <laughs> which he says to Kyle about Mauricio. Well, was it he will never fulfill you or you'll never fulfill him? Because I thought it was something about oh, Kyle being maybe. too old. Well, and there was also this line she had at the end. She goes, well, I know when she's going to die. But, like, right. there was, like, so I much. I love that about But me. there were so many <laughs> lines in that that even Bravo, I don't think, has picked, like, the iconic line from that particular dinner party. Oh, so, and is that the one where Camille talks about Faye Resnick? What is the adjective yes. she uses? The morally corrupt. The oh, morally corrupt the Faye morally Resnick corrupt. that she realized it's Faye Resnick because she's seen her on Playboy or something like that. Okay, so let me figure out how many points that was. So and I'll give three, four, five, six. Okay, I'll give you six for that. Yay. Okay. What do I get? Oh, no, okay, we're going to your answers what? next. You got to, you got to, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to go through all your stuff. Well, well, Talk in your mic, okay. I'm oh, sorry, you got to go through all, all the things you wrote down. It was Kyle. It was a fight with Allison Dubois, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. I didn't realize that it was um, the first season, mm -hmm. but I did remember that there was a jab about Kyle being too old for Mauricio. It's just, I'm with Jennifer. I don't know if the debate is he'll never fulfill you or you'll never fulfill him. Okay. I can give you a five for that one because of the season, the missing season. And I can do the electronic cigarette. Yes. Okay, so amazing. We have a six and a five. Max, what'd you get for this one? I wrote Ginger Lady Medium. <laughs> ginger Lady. I remember. Did she have red hair? I thought she had red hair. I think so. I think you're and right. um, did you get the franchise? I got R H O B H. In the season? No, I wrote two. I thought it was season two. Okay. Lapse in judgment, and then I wrote Faye Resnick. You got Faye Resnick. Okay. Did you get Camille? No. Okay. Well, I think, I feel like this is a three. <laughs> Our next one. This dinner party included a housewife in purple eating gummy bears. And she accused another housewife of trying to cause her ill will. This one does have an iconic line. I feel like there are so many. The gummy bears here is really the hint. That's what's throwing me. 
oh, you're going to be really upset. Yeah. You are, you are going to literally <laughs> like have a little mini explosion if you don't get this right. Really? Yes. I'm ready. Let yeah. me, let my, me, let me say this one more time. I'm ready. And this also is, it's, um, if you get the episode name on this one, I will also give a bonus point because it's one of the most iconic. The dinner party included a housewife in purple eating gummy bears and she was accusing another housewife of trying to cause her ill will. Okay. Is everybody locked in? Jessica's locked. Max is- I'm locked. <laughs> I'm so lost in the woods right now. Okay. Okay, Jennifer, <laughs> what did you get? Okay, so that's Scary Island. It Real is. Housewives of oh my New York God. season three. Um, oh and it's Kelly Kalor and Ben Simone to Bethany Frankel, um, who's apparently not a chef. And Bethany yelled, go to sleep, go to sleep. Yes, go to sleep, go to sleep. You're crazy. When <laughs> on this most recent season, when Bethany yelled that at Luann, go to sleep, I think it was, or you're crazy. Sonia, you, right? Oh, it yeah, Sonia. it was Sonia. You're right. Did you have flashbacks to Scary Island? The way that, like, her cape, like, the, the her pitch, the way she yeah. said that, I had deep flashbacks. It was almost exact. It was crazy. Yeah. Okay, what did you get, Jessica? Oh, I have a blank piece of paper. Oh. Because I didn't watch Real Housewives in New York back then. Um, I should have known it based on, I should have known it based on all the times you guys talk about Scary Island. That should have been the key, but I had a, I have a blank sheet of paper. Oh. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. Max apparently you never, did too. <laughs> That's his have favorite you not, episode. <laughs> Jessica, have you never gone back to look at like those early seasons? Honestly, are, they, you tr- are you trying to pull my street cred right now? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying with... there's so much joy ahead of you just waiting on Hulu to be watched. Honestly, it's so good. I've gone back to the seasons when Jill was on, and it just doesn't compute for me. Mm. It just doesn't compute. But I will go back. I, I Jill will is go back. I will go back since you've encouraged me to go back because clearly I'm going to miss out on every single game we have. <laughs> If I don't, you know, so watch this 24 Were you like a zero on that response? Oh, on, totally. It, and it really is Max's favorite episode yeah. of Housewives, like, ever. Oh, it's, no. his, even, it's even his favorite season of all times of any franchise. It's such a good season. What threw me was when you said dressed in purple. Yeah, she was wearing this interesting purple dress. And I guess I bears. didn't think of that as a dinner party. I just thought, like, oh, they're going out to dinner. Or... Bethany's just cooking dinner for it, like it didn't the, all the things well, did they not were really it was the me. dinner inside the the house they rented mm-hmm. in St. John yeah so no you're right I'm an idiot like I don't <laughs> disagree with you I'm just saying like he I had a thought different vision of dinner parties okay yeah, I thought it was you want to hear who I thought it was who? I thought it was Shannon yelling at Tamara in like season 10 mm. and I thought oh. like the quote was like all I want to do is eat <laughs> When she like yelled that, you remember? No. Yeah, no, it wasn't that one. Also, okay. a gif I use frequently. <laughs> this one, I, I, I will think- say, I've had a tough year just in terms of a lot of things going on, and one of the things I've done is gone back to watch early seasons of OC and New York, and it's very comforting. It's like putting on like sweatpants and putting my hair up. It's it's fantastic. So mm-hmm. I would encourage anyone to go back and just enjoy those again or enjoy. I them mean, the Vicky was amazing. all downhill after she stopped going to Lake Havasu. It's like seven oh, cases ago. You have a point. Yeah, I mean, really, really, the whole ditching Don thing was only bad news for her. Right. Okay, so this last dinner party question, I'm, I'm hoping that this is so iconic that everybody just gets full credit. Okay, this dinner party included a discussion of a book, shouting, and table flipping. Oh. I feel like these are highlights of my own personal life. <laughs> <laughs> I was there for that. It's like, it's like, it's like hmm, maybe we've all been to this dinner party. <laughs> it would be a weird, it, it would be an interesting study to look at like how housewives have like become our own memories. Like, like this person, I don't want to give it away, but like this person is now like a member of our family shouting this iconic line. That, yeah. Yes. But I use them so frequently on social media that sometimes in, like, a department meeting, I sort of just want, like, Sheree to speak for me. um, And I don't know how to communicate what I'm feeling without Dorinda screaming, I made it nice or something. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like this is the language I'm using on social media so frequently, like, in in person-to-person interactions. I feel like I'm lacking without being able to show those. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
Okay. Are you all locked in? Yes. Okay. What did you get, Jennifer? Um, so this is season one of The Real High Boys of New Jersey with Teresa Giudice yelling at Danielle Staub um, with the book. And um, I would say the iconic line is, um, oh, there's two. Like there's Caroline Manzo with, you know, let me tell you something about my family. We're sick as thieves. But there's also the, you've been engaged 19 times. Ah! I was, I was, I was thinking of the, you prostitution whore, because that's actually what she screams while she flips the table, which is just like, it's like she's summoned so much. And like, it's like those moments where you hear the stories about those mothers who've like lifted the car to like save their child in the wreck or whatever. But like (laughs) Teresa seems to have like summoned that kind of strength and energy as she screams that while flipping the table. So. I can't believe I forgot to say the prostitution horror part because I've treated that scene as my personal Zabruder film and have watched it over and over and over. I feel like from multiple angles. Back and to the left. The table goes back and to the yeah. left. Okay. So we'll we'll do a five on that one for for the for the line. Okay. Jessica? I feel like I should get more credit for this one. Okay. Same thing. Real Housewives of New Jersey first season. This was you knew the season. I'm so I proud know. of you. <laughs> I know. This is about Danielle. This is about Teresa. This is the you whore line. But also, didn't the controversy start because Dina Manzo was the one that went in and investigated the book and circulated Yes, it? the fight really is be- originally between Danielle and and Dina. I feel like I should get but some that. But that was for the few. Yeah, but that no, was that was Nina denied. I, feel like I should get a, a point. Shh, help me out. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, all season long, all season long, um, Danielle and Dina were having conflict, right? Mm-hmm. So this was this was kind of the culmination of Dina and Caroline are spreading this around about me around town, and it's not true. And like Teresa just like snapped. <laughs> but it's interesting that they're all going to the state. They shop at the same fashion place they, they at the same uh, boutique they all go to the same salon it was that Dina had brought it into the salon right that was right. the issue yeah did you write prostitution horror down on your sheet no because I was thinking about the 19 times and I was thinking wasn't there a kidnapping involved I didn't put prostitution horror okay well then we'll give you a five two I just can remember certain details about that story because I was trans transfixed by it okay Max can you redeem yourself from scary island yeah yeah I have this I have Ronge. Season one, uh, Teresa Guidici mm-hmm. uh, to Danielle Saab mm-hmm. over the book. And then I even have the quote, you were engaged 19 times, prostitution whore, table flip. I feel like that's your think first that's perfect. So we'll give you a, we'll give you the, the six bonus. Good. It was like fabulous. Okay, now let me tally points. But wait, with the table flip, right? With the table flip. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I remember more than that than the iconic line. Yeah. Okay. So I think Max is going to be in third place today <laughs> with <laughs> Max got 11 <laughs> points. Okay. Jessica will be in second. This is the happiest day. With 12 points. This is the happiest day. And Max doesn't give me any. Wait, let's. I'm oh. going to take two. I need a sound effect. Uh, I was picking it. For I know. You. you should have already known. I needed a sound effect if I wasn't. Gonna... No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe everybody just needs clapping. No, that could have been mine. That, that, that could have been, been mine. mine. No, yours should have been second. Mine should have been crickets. And Jennifer mm-hmm. swept with 19. Wow. Okay. Here we go. Back to the interview. Mother Mary was an important figure for the nuns that you study at San Croix. Can you tell us more about the way that Radigan was seen as a mother figure and how a sense of spiritual motherhood and community motherhood functioned at the monastery? And are there housewives that behave in similar ways to these medieval nuns when it comes to motherhood? Sure. Because Radigan was a saint, um, that's really a complicated position. She was a woman who, um, she, uh, as a girl, had been kidnapped twice. Her, her parents were killed by her uncle, who took her as a prisoner of war, and then her uncle 
uh, was killed by her, the man who became her husband, the, the King of Francia at the time. And so she was a prisoner of war twice over. She was forced to marry this captor. Um, and that becomes a little bit tricky. There's no suggestion in her early lives that she resisted sex with him. And that's, that's a very common trope in or common topos in medieval saints' lives is, you know, women are put in the danger of having sex, but then saved in some way um, that they can preserve their virginity. And so because Radigand actually did have sex, but didn't have children, her, you know, the, the texts of her biography that make the case for her sanctity have a little bit of a difficult position. Um, and one of the things they do is say that she was unhappy being her husband's bedmate and that she would get up in the night and go to the altar and she would spend her, her time, you know, lying on the cold stone floor in front of the altar and that her husband would complain that he was married to basically a nun. Um, and then eventually Radigan ran away from him and founded a monastery. She founded the monastery on land that he possessed. So it's interesting that she didn't completely flee him. And uh, her husband, um, Clothar, uh, we know that he had many wives, and we don't know the dates for all of them. So it, it's possible that um, he was a polygynist uh, or that he just sequentially had a number of wives. But, you know, he went and got an heir elsewhere. So Radigan is somebody who's had sex but has not had children. And it's not clear whether she didn't have children because she tried to resist him or uh, she just was infertile, or that, you know, according to the saints' lives, that God protected her, or whatever. Um, it makes it a very complicated process to make her into a saint. And one of the ways they do that is to create a maternity for her, because she is this woman who's had sex, uh, but a maternity that is not of a living child, but of um, adopted children, or children that she's sort of taken on. So she is a stepmother. She has lots of... of um, uh, the kings who take over after her husband dies, because um, Francia is um, a place that practices partable inheritance, which is what we do, too. If you have three kids, you're dividing your property among your three kids. It's just strange for a kingdom to do that. So she has lots of um, princes who become kings, that she had a maternal relationship with them. Um, so they describe, you know, these men looking to her for advice and that she's writing people beyond the monastery and trying to keep peace between her former stepsons and all of that. Um, but also she is described by the most famous and um, excellent poet of her time, but not just Fortunatus, who writes one of her biographies. Um, he actually is fascinated with her and comes and lives in Poitiers to be near her and exchanges poet, poems with her um, that he writes about how she um, deserves violets because the purple is a royal color um, and that she is his mother. And when Radigan founds the monastery, she does not become abbess, which is a little bit un unusual even in that time in the sixth century. Um, there's a lot of monastic women who uh, found the monastery and then become its abbess. Um, and she decides to name somebody else. And it's a much younger woman named Agnes. And Agnes and Venatius Fortunatus form sort of a, a little family with Radigand as their mother. So typically, an abbess would be the mother to the community, but in this case, Radigand is the mother who's never had children and isn't even in the official position where you would think of her as a mother. So spiritual motherhood is something that she, that the, that the, the biographers and the people who create art about her later are all using to demonstrate uh, her authority over the people around her and to explain why people love her and respect her and adore her, even though she isn't a virgin. Um, and there's a lot of um, connections between her and the Virgin Mary. She sees images of the Virgin Mary. At one point, there's a story in the town that um, the town is under attack by soldiers and the keys of the town are 
stolen. And then there are images of the Virgin Mary, Radigan, and another uh, a male state from the town who appear over the city gate, just as apparitions that frighten the soldiers away. And then they find the keys to the city gates are being held by a statue of the Virgin Mary in a church devoted to the Virgin in the town center. Um, so there's a lot of connections in Poitiers and in the stories about Radigan between Radigan and the Virgin Mary. Um, and then Radigan also heals a number of infants um, she heals them when she's alive, but then also some of her secondary relics, you know, things that touched her body, like her hair shirt, um, heal um, infants later. Um, so this kind of position of a woman who is, oh, and I'm sorry, I should also say, Radigan is sometimes very cranky in her biography. Um, like I said, the, the issue with the chair, but also there's... Um, a, a story that she's hearing a lot of uh, people dance and she wants the noise of that to go away so that she can properly focus on her prayer. Um, and she, she really wants people to, you know, calm down um, around her so that she can, she can focus. Um, so Radigan's um, maternity often makes me think, you know, it's this kind of honorary motherhood. And I feel like there are a lot of housewives across the franchises who want that kind of position. They want, they feel like they have some wisdom to share and sometimes they want to guide and bring along some younger housewives. Sometimes they're looking for alliances. Like I feel like Vicky is often in that, that sort of camp where she, you know, she makes friends with, um, well, initially with Lori Peterson, but then Lori finds her Prince Charming, um, her George, um, or, uh, Lizzie or, um, Alexis when Vicky is befriending people like that. I feel like she's trying to find somebody who will accept her, but also somebody she can bring along into the group, which is an interesting place for her because Vicky is so often hostile to the younger women when they first come on. Um, or, um, and forgive me, I'm, I'm only in the first season of Potomac. Um, I'm a, a latecomer to new shows um, like Potomac. Uh, but uh, from what I've seen, um, Karen Huger on that first season is really excited and explicit about um, mentoring women, about mentoring, having mentored Giselle in the past wanting to take on Ashley initially and it doesn't seem to go very well but I don't know what's to come um, but somebody like Jill Zarin taking on Bethany or Caroline Manzo you know feeling like it's her duty to go and and build the peace between Teresa and Melissa um, but they seem to want this respect for other women and to be able to teach them and guide them um, I was thinking this week that Miss Pat on Southern Charm very much wants that position, you know, the way that she was with Ashley or um, now the way she's acting with Catherine, um, that they're trying to be relevant and connected, but they also want the respect and the adoration of people around them. Um, and the ultimate example of this is Lisa Vanderpump. Um, she just does this over and over again with first season with Cedric. Um, and then with Brandy and more recently with Teddy and all along with Kyle that Lisa is very clear that she is the older member of that friendship, that she's the one with the advice, that she's the one um, who's going to tell them the way it needs to be. Uh, but in all of these cases, or most of these cases, the younger, the, the mothered housewife pushes back. Um, or maybe not so much with Catherine and Pat, but that there's this pushback in which there's like... Um, this decision that the, the mothering is not necessary or that the mothering leads them to stray, astray or that the mothering is self-serving. Um, and in the case of San Qua, there the, the rebellion I talked about earlier, the, the 6th century abbess who takes over in the generation after Radigan died. Radigan died and then Agnes died at the end of the 6th century and uh, early in the seventh century, there's a new abbess and there are these princesses and they don't feel like they need to listen to this abbess, even though she's in the position. And they launch this major rebellion in which they hire a gang of thugs and they attack the monastery. They actually kidnap the abbess and they hold her in a neighboring church for a little while. And then they fight amongst themselves. And then there's three different camps of people fighting, the ones that support the abbess and the one that supports two of the different princesses. And then they they um, come together again. And these women are actually not really penalized. One of them goes back to the monastery and one of them is kind of given a new place to live on her own. 
Um, and she never goes back to the monastery, but she seems to be just fine where she is. Um, so there, there's this like pushback against, uh, this, this, uh, this alternate relationship. Um, whereas I feel like the, the more natural mothering that happens, you know, it can be controversial. It can be uncomfortable, you know, candy and mama Joyce or, um, well, that's the, that's the best example or Lee, not Leanne. I have forgotten the name of the woman on Dallas. whose mother will not let her have the keys to the company. Deandra. Um, and her mother, like, I feel like those relationships, the tie is more interwoven and, and unbreakable. Whereas some of these others are more ruptured than what I saw with Radigan. But then the stories that were being written about Radigan were very pro Radigan. Um, where we're seeing, you know, more of the story play out here. Was motherhood as policed at San Croix as it is on the Housewives shows? Yes. <laughs> um, so the nuns aren't really mothers, right? Um, and often, like when I think about motherhood being policed, often in the Middle Ages, it's about the failure to be a mother, that's really policed. And if a noble woman couldn't have children, um, she could be put aside by her husband. That was one of the justifications for allowing him to remarry. You know, divorce is not really a thing in the Middle Ages, but in a case of infertility, um, that's always blamed on the woman and she can be put aside. And so there were groups of women in the monastery who uh, had failed in their supposedly woman's responsibility to have their husband's heir. And that did happen at San Croix. I mean, really, Radigan herself is one of these wives who did not succeed in being a wife. She didn't want to succeed um, or being a mother. And so they joined these monasteries, um, these places where not having sex or the logical outcome of having sex with the child um, is acceptable. So the, the whole space of the monastery is this safe space where virginity is the premium, the, the, the um, most high status position supposedly for women in the Middle Ages once you enter the church. Um, but there, there are these women who are, are in the monasteries because their lives have not gone the way they expected them to, and so they're there. And there's also a lot of women in the monastery who, or in monasteries in general in the Middle Ages, who um, were widows, and it's a logical next step for a wealthy woman to enter a monastery where they can live quiet lives um, and don't have to, especially if they um, have modest estates. You know, they have enough that they can make a donation to the monastery and enter, um, but they they don't want to be a burden on their children or they want a place where they don't have to think about a second marriage, especially if they're past the point of childbearing. Um, so the idea of, of who's even in the monastery and what sort of activities they're taking on there, um, but the, the relationship between the abbess and her nuns, that's supposed to be very maternal. They're calling her Mother Abbess. Um, one of the opportunities I have for sources in the Middle Ages for San Qua is moments when the nuns are complaining about their abbot. So I have that case from the 6th century, um, but there's a number of cases in the late 15th and early 16th century where women are making complaints to the French Parliament, um, the Parliament of Paris, um, or the king or the pope about their abbess and saying that she's not mothering them properly so that she's not giving them enough food or allowing them enough opportunity for advancement or giving them, they're supposed to get um, new clothes once a year. She's not giving them the clothes or ensuring they have enough candles to be able to see um, that she doesn't provide for their table. Or one of the big accusations that I hear is that she does not take care of the monastery. She doesn't manage its finances well enough to ensure community. And so the nuns in the late 15th century, early 16th century start to value dining in common areas or sleeping in common dormitories. Whereas at, at San Croix, because they were so wealthy, they actually had um, these separate spaces within the monastery where, you know, maybe a group of five women, I feel, I feel like it's like um, those dormitories where they have the suites, <laughs> where they have uh, a couple of, of women sharing a common space. And then that, that forms clicks. And if you have maybe 25 nuns in a monastery and five of them are in one dormitory and three of them are in another dormitory, you know, it just 
it breeds dissension and problems. And there's a lot of fractured community um, within there. And in that way, I feel like they're policing the spiritual maternity of the abbess by saying that she's not providing adequately for them and that they're pushing back, um, which reminds me so much of, say, you know, Teddy. (laughs) <laughs> saying, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do your dirty work anymore. I'm not going to just, you know, turn a blind eye and let you um, do all of this. And one of the things they say in the end of the 15th century, which I love, is they complain that the abbess is um, favoring her own family so much. And this is very common that families tended to cluster in monasteries. Like that's the, that's the monastery where your aunt is. And so you're going to go there and it winds up being, you know, 12 cousins will be in the same monastery. And of course they look to one another. So they, at this time of this dispute in the late 15th century, they, in the 1470s and eighties, they look to their family member and support her. Um, But there's 13 other nuns in the monastery that are not members of that family and they feel excluded and that they're not getting the same privileges. And then they start to complain. It occurs to me that I don't think we've asked, how did Radigan get sainted? Like, why was she sainted? Uh, This is tricky. So the process for actually making a saint becomes more formal in, say, the 11th or 12th century, where the the Vatican starts, what will become the Vatican starts to control it, that 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 will eventually become an actual office of the papacy as part of what we call the 11th century reform movement, um, where the church... Everything starts to become more written and more formalized. There starts to be offices to investigate. Uh, you know, when we what we think today of, of people becoming a saint, you know, they have to have a certain number of living uh, miracles and they have to have a certain number of posthumous miracles and there have to be a certain number of people who testify to their experience of that person as a holy person. In the early Middle Ages, there's nothing like that. So if you were to ask a member of the church today, they would say Radigan's not really a saint. But she was popularly recognized in the Middle Ages and celebrated, but she's not on the official calendars now. It's all very political of how, who they go back to and then include. So there's a number of saints that were recognized as saints, just like Radigan was in the 6th century by kind of a popular cult, um, who then, you know, it's kind of like they're, they're you know, it's uh, the back orders of the saints uh, that they go back and they formalize. And Radigan is not one of those. Um, but Really, what happened was uh, people wrote these holy biographies in the generation after her death, and those biographies circulated. People recognized uh, her shrine as a space where miracles were worked. The most famous uh, bishop in Western France, Gregory of Tours, also writes about Radigan in his history, uh, where he and in his um, his books. Uh, where he's talking about the saints um, and holy people of, of uh, the 6th century. And so when they start recording them in text, uh, that becomes a way of circulating ideas about her sanctity. Um, there's a large number of foundations to Radigan. So there's her initial shrine, her great shrine in Poitiers. But then you, you could look at the map of shrines of Radigan just all over France and even into England. Um, if you go to Cambridge, there's actually a St. Radigan pub and Jesus College, you know, has some um, uh, paint murals painted of her. She's one of their patron saints. And so, you know, her cult kind of spread, but it's really by popular acclamation rather than by anything official. And the officials have not gone back. Although, interestingly, at the beginning of the 20th century, France is sort of looking for these ways to, um, especially... Um, you know, in 1920 or so, they're looking for ways to inspire the population and for images of maternity uh, and images of uh, great women who can symbolize what it means to be French um, and to be French in this new, you know, interwar sort of place. And one of the women they pick out is Joan of Arc, who is a famous virgin who leads troops and symbolizes the French people. And another one they pick is Radigan, who was this queen who focused on the church. Um, it's fascinating to me that like this very secular French state picks somebody like Radigan, and they call her the mother of the, the mère de la patrie, so the mother of the fatherland, really is what it means. You know that there was a lot of pressure for noble women in the medieval period to have children, and they could get blamed for infertility. Um, how did they struggle with fertility, and 
most importantly, how is it similar to what we see on Housewives, or is it similar? Um, so I think first to understand the, the medieval uh, attitude towards infertility, you have to understand the, the kind of medical notion of conception, um, because there's this kind of two-seed idea, uh, according to kind of ancient or medieval medical notions of the body in that both the man and the woman release a seed during sex um, and that the seeds come together to form the fetus, I guess, um, the embryo or, or eventually becomes the child. And because a man releases seed through pleasure, experiencing pleasure in the act of sex, a woman, they said, must also release a seed through experiencing pleasure. And so if women are not conceiving, that must be because they are not fulfilling their role during the sex act. Um, and so they're, if they're not conceiving, it's their fault. Because you know that the man is ejaculating. And why isn't the woman doing her part? Um, somehow that doesn't get translated into, you know, making sex better for women. Um, but it does get translated into rape cases where a woman, if a woman conceives, then there can be some real questions. She has argued that she was raped, but she has conceived a child. They'll say, no, she was seduced um, because she obviously enjoyed it. Um, so infertility is always a woman's problem. It's not a man, man's problem. There will be sometimes uh, later on in like the 17th century, kind of this idea that a, a man is not having sex enough and that's why the they're not having children. Um, sort of, uh, if you've watched The Return of Martin Gare, when they do the shali vati scary scene and they throw like the testicles at him um, where they're shaming him for not having conceived a child, they say it's his fault in that case, but they say it's because he's not having sex with his wife enough and doing his manly job there. So for noble women um, who are infertile or not having children, um, it's usually seen as their fault. And um, you also have to think like women are getting married around age 12 or 13, basically as soon as they menstruate. Um, and they're having, uh, when they have a pregnancy, um, they probably have one every year. They, if they have a child, they use a nursemaid so, because breastfeeding has that contraceptive effect on the body. And so they're able to have that pregnancy every single year. So a, a 30-year-old woman has probably had maybe 16, 17 pregnancies. Um, and that's exhausting on the female body. Um, but the idea is, you know, you're striking while the iron's hot. You know, the women are more fertile when they're younger. They're, they're, they don't know this, but the, the eggs are more viable. Um, so if you look at somebody like Catherine of Aragon, you know, once we look a little bit farther ahead, like into the 16th century, we, we know a lot more about the, the pregnancies. Um, uh, Catherine of Aragon had many, many pregnancies, like over a dozen, um, and some live births, but only one child who lived to adulthood. Um, Teresa Ehrenfeit is talking, is, is writing about um, Catherine and her infertility, um, and then the, also the infertility of... Um, Queen Mary, who also had a lot of struggles, um, never actually had a child. Um, and Therese argues that if the, the one son that Catherine actually did have, um, who died as a child, had if that son had lived, if Henry had lived and survived, there probably wouldn't have been an Anglican Reformation because Henry VIII would never have had a reason to break with the church. So women's for, uh, issues of fertility can be have serious ramifications. Um, you know, there wouldn't have been this Anne Boleyn and all of these other issues um, or a reformation in England. Um, so this is also exhausting <laughs> for these women. Um, death and childbirth was very, very common. We know miscarriage is very common even today with so many, so much um, medical intervention um, and miscarriage was very common then. Stillbirth was very common. Um, and these childless ladies would be displaced. Um, it was really rare for somebody like um, Edward the Confessor's wife, um, Edith, I think Edith of Wessex. Um, she was childless, but uh, they created this story that they were both chaste, and so they stayed together, that they really loved one another. Um, could have been true. Um, so for modern people... Um, especially our housewives, they're very comfortable with medical interventions on their bodies. Um, and science has offered, you know, lots of opportunities to handle infertility. Um, but I feel like their paths are 
feel problematic in some similar ways. Um, like if you think about a Tinsley Mortimer crying with her mother Dale on the couch, oh, were they also wearing wedding dresses or was Tinsley wearing a wedding dress and looking at her not even fertilized eggs, um, pictures of them and crying, thinking about timing and cultural pressures. And, you know, for her, it's, you know, also laden with not finding somebody to love her. Um, but I feel like there's still this kind of idea that, uh, that women are expected to be fertile, to pro- be providing their husbands with children at the right time, and not just their husbands, their societies. Um, but we get people like um, Megan King Edmonds or Jenny Poulos are on Flipping Out who are, you know, going very publicly through IVF on camera, and we're seeing, you know, the injections. And so those are opportunities that medieval women never had. Um, and yet, uh, I feel like the stress and the pain and the anxiety about it, you know, Megan is such an interesting case to me because Jim Edmonds clearly did not want to have a child with her, um, was clearly done having children. It doesn't often appear like he likes her even, um, but he says that he wants to have this child with her in order to keep her because she wants this child so very much and a child of her own. Um, which is so interesting in the way that Vicky and Tamara had kind of gone at Megan about, like she was a mother, she was a stepmother, but that's not being a real mother to Vicky and Tamara. And so even adding to the pressure of even when she's serving in this alternative mothering role that's insufficient, even to other women that we're seeing. Um, and so Megan goes through this journey and she tries to suggest that she's going through fertility treatments because she's experiencing infertility, which as I went through IVF myself, and that feels very offensive. Um, as somebody who, you know, I feel like my journey was not as difficult as many other women, but you know, I was over 40 and wasn't working out and the, the injections are very painful and the, the, the long wait even to get to the point of doing IVF, you know, there's a lot of, so that, that road is walked with a lot of sadness, you know, and a lot of, uh, delayed hope, um, that for a lot of people, it's unfulfilled hope. I was lucky. I, I, IVF worked for me and I have a, a lovely little boy. Um, I have two lovely little boys, one of them through IVF. But when Megan's saying that she's experiencing infertility, she's, she's young and has a husband who had a vasectomy. Um, that's not infertility in the same way that somebody who's, you know, experiencing lots of miscarriages and, um, has done IUIs and has been temping and uh, charting and, and experience, you know, peeing on um, ovulation sticks every month and, and, uh, and just to see, you know, month after month after month to see the, the pregnancy tests, ha- you know, not get your two lines or for it to say not pregnant or something like that. Um, where Jenny's story speaks much more to me of, you know, somebody who's trying for a second child who feels greedy because she already has a child, um, anxious about how her life's going to change, trying to maintain her job while experiencing, you know, the pain of the IVF treatment. And, you know, I think for Jenny, it didn't work the first time and had to do it again. I, I'm not sure if I remember that right. At some point in that season, I broke up with, um, with flipping out. Um, I couldn't take Jeff anymore. But, uh, you know, that's uh, really interesting how those the medical interventions now, the new science that for a long time, you know, I think what, since the 60s, has allowed women to to have more options. It still is really painful and it's still bound up with all these cultural pressures about who we are as women. And especially for the housewives, of, you know, if you're not married or you don't have a child, do you really even belong on the show? Who are you? What are you doing here? And is, are you properly a woman and properly a housewife if you haven't experienced this the way that others have? And there's so many of the housewives who have gotten there through alternate we, make, alternate means, you know, Brandy and adopting, which was controversial with the way Cameron came at her, or um, Adrian and the surrogacy on OC and the ways that uh, she was horrified and was going to sue Brandy Glanville for even revealing that she had her children with a surrogate um, and and that that news was out, even though she had a long opportunity to be able to tell her children before the news was really out. You know, that, that was that was monstrous. That, like her femininity was questioned or her motherhood was questioned because she used these alternate means. Um, we still, I feel like there's still parallels. So it's kind of that patriarchal equilibrium that Judith Bennett talks about where we have so much more at our fingertips but 
some of those cultural pressures about womanhood are still present. So we're now going to move into our first ever Bravo special report segment, which is our Bravo news update. Okay, so you shared with us an update on Catherine and Thomas's court battle that we have not seen, and it, I just was like, oh my gosh, how have we not seen this? So, so can you update us as our court reporter on what is happening with Catherine and Thomas? <laughs> sure. Okay, so um, it was either last week or the week before that Catherine's mother died, um, and I think there was a lot of social media, um, you know, people extending to, uh, comfort to Catherine about the loss of her mother, and that's all very sad. And then suddenly there were these reports, and some of those shadier, not, not even a Daily Mail, like some of those celebrity gossip sites, um, and some of them are very friendly to Thomas Ravenel. Um, but there were suddenly all these news reports revealing that as part of the custody case between Thomas and Catherine, which is back and, and really ramping up very, very uh, hot topic right now, um, there was an affidavit in which Catherine admitted that she had had an abortion um, of a child that she conceived in November, I think, 2015, with Thomas. Um, I haven't looked to see where that matches up with the reunions, but I would be fascinated to do that. Um, but that she had an abortion in early 2016, which was right before she entered rehab and lost her children. Um, and it's not clear who's revealed, you know, leaked that information. Um, but I have seen speculation that maybe um, Thomas in the court case is speculating that having had the abortion of that baby or that fetus um, uh, suggests that Catherine didn't want children that she already had um, and that Catherine wasn't a good mother. Um, and it's interesting, too, to think about the timing um Catherine apparently had the procedure, but it didn't, but there was some complication. And so she had to have DNC, um, but she had the DNC once she was in rehab. So there's been some suggestion by people that Catherine has had to respond to suggesting that she had, you know, that she was in rehab and having an abortion there. Um, so the social media's response has been really ramping up the slut shaming and suggesting that she was a bad mother um, you know, there's both the suggesting that she's, you know, a gold digger, a loose woman for having gotten pregnant, and then the suggestion that she's a bad mother for not going through with the pregnancy. Um, I have seen on Facebook, on some of the kind of Southern Charm groups, a lot of support for Catherine, but most of that is kind of pushing back against this uh, narrative, this old narrative of, of Catherine as kind of a red woman, a, like naughty gold digger bad mother um, that we've seen before. Um, and it seems especially cool to have all of this happening right as Catherine is mourning her mother. And what it's also really eclipsing. Um, you know, uh, Catherine gave a, an interview to People Magazine where she said that her mother had been sick for a year and a half and that Catherine had been nursing her, which is not an aspect of Catherine we ever really see. Um, this kind of filial relationship um, this nurturing Catherine, this beautiful daughter, um, has been greatly eclipsed by this new image of her as this loose woman who's using abortion as health care and, um, you know, using that to try to position Thomas uh, as the person who should get their children, that she should lose custody as a result of this. Um, and Thomas also, just this week on Monday, Thomas posted a picture of their children children with his own mother and people are seeing that as really cruel because he has not been on Twitter since like June and to suddenly come back to Twitter to post a picture of the children with their other grandmother on Twitter uh, when Catherine is you know suffering in this way and people came at him hard and Thomas did what he always does which is delete his Twitter account altogether rather than face controversy or speak back to it. Thank you. This was like an excellent court report session. Now, the, <laughs> the other segment really quickly is we've encouraged people to write in and weigh in on episode content, and you're actually the first to do this. And so you 
I actually sent an email with receipts to talk about the text exchange or the Twitter exchange between the Dawn and Vicky incident um, when she was demoted to friend of the show. So I was wondering if you would be so willing as to share what you found out about Dawn's account. From yeah, episode so that's one. A, that is, yes. Um, so that is a fake account. It's a parody account. Um, I, I find it fascinating. Whoever runs, I don't know who runs that account, but it is, um, that, that person has a great sense of humor. And it really um, gets Vicky's goat. Vicky has tweeted um, a couple times about that account, but um, when she said this is a fake account that Don has attempted to take down, he does not read our post on Twitter, which I like to think of Don out there just living his life, like not paying attention to anything going on on Twitter. But I also love this alternate persona. And in fact, the Don Gunvalson account, like at Don Gunvalson, um, it's the, the little life description of him is the parody life. Um, so he tries to, he tries to make it clear, but not super clear. Um, it's a great account to follow, but unfortunately, even as, as delicious as it, it seems, it's not the real Don thing. Yet. That's a shame. You really got to like be looking for it. So Jennifer, tell us what's next for you. What are you working on and how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more? So my book is out. Um, it's called Superior Women, Medieval Female Authority in Poitiers. <laughs> Sorry, to celebrate the book release. You know, that feels so That's good, awesome. Jennifer. You, you, you That's know, great. You need to carry that around with you since it just came out when? July, just last month? Wow. Yeah, it was officially out in July. I think... I'm confused. I think it's out on Kindle, but that Amazon's not quite fulfilling orders yet. Um, I don't know if they have a lot of, you know, pre-orders that are just waiting for their book to arrive, but I have it physically in my home. I have held it in my hands. Um, and it came out with Oxford, which I'm so excited with. Um, and I'm working... <laughs> for Oxford, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm working on a new project, which isn't so new because I started talking about it in graduate school, but now I finally finished the nun's book and I can move on to, um, I'm working on a new project about, it's called Holy Healing, um, Leprosy and the Cult of the Medieval Saints. Um, and it really does look at uh, how saints deal with uh, people suffering from leprosy. And it's, you know, saints heal the dead. They, they cure death. So there's really nothing beyond the power of the saints. And yet they don't heal leprosy that often. Or when they do, the saints that actually cure leprosy are all male. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what's going on there, that there's some kind of gender division of labor in the cult of saints only when it comes to leprosy. Um, or why is leprosy a disease? Um, you know, they're curing blindness, they're mending limbs. Why are they not doing more for people suffering from leprosy? So that's the next big project. Um, but I'm also working on this. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Reacting to the Past pedagogy developed at Barnard College, um, but it's this uh, pedagogy where people create role-play games. They're like extended immersion scenarios in which you are in the French Revolution, or you're um, working with Frederick Douglass, or you're uh, rebuilding the Athenian Constitution after the end of the Peloponnesian War. Um, so they're real-world dispute debate that students take on roles, and some of them last one class, some of them can last an entire class. Um, and there's a bunch of them out there, but there aren't so many on the Middle Ages, and there's very few with female characters at the center of them. So I'm working on a reacting to the past game about Christine de Pizan, who is a very popular writer at the end of the 15th century. Her book sold, uh, well, I mean, they didn't really sell copies, but she, there, were, there were lots and lots and lots of these manuscripts of Christine de Pizan. Um, and she participated in the 15th century in a debate about whether women were competent. Um, and there's this very misogynist kind of anti-feminine debate. And Rad uh, Christine got in there and she exchanged letters with a large group of men. And those letters are preserved. So you can have students take on roles with all of these different people who were engaging in that. But also Christine de Pizan wrote about Joan of Arc. She was at the court where... Um, you know, Henry V kind of comes in and he marries the daughter of the queen that uh, Christine is writing for. Um, so there's all these very famous people uh, kind of going in and out of the world that Christine occupied. And so there's lots of opportunities there. And it's a game where people could play it in like a medieval history class, but also a women's studies course or a French class. 
Um, so I'm really excited about that game and writing something that's about teaching, um, not just about, you know, what I do in the archive. Um, if you want to find me, I tweet at um, Prof. Jen Edwards. I tweet really sporadically. I'm nervous about Twitter. I'm more of a Facebook person, um, but you can't find me on Facebook. Um, I also have a WordPress page. I have an academia.edu page. I'll post links to those on my Twitter profile. Well, thank you so much for calling in to be with us today. Thank you so much for having me. And really, thank you for starting this um, place where people like me can poke out of that closet and become more open about our bravo Bravo demic status. You are very welcome. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 As always, you can find us at historiansonhousewives.com, where you can propose episode topics, blog posts, journal articles, ask us questions, or send us feedback. You can also follow us on Twitter at historiansh. And remember, we live tweet Sunday through Thursday. Thank you to Jennifer Edwards. This show is brought to you with support by Barbara and Mark Spear. Saddleback Community College, Christina Hinkle, Christina Gambapore, Jed Merlaski, Pete Murray, Cody Baker, Molly Callahan, Dr. Joaquin Galarza, Courtney Crow, Lara Loper, Kim Bettendorf, and Louis Asio de Dios. And remember, scholars do bravo too. If you guys had a couple bottles of Pinot Grigio, you're like one step away from a housewife's site of like, why are you looking at me that way? <laughs> <laughs>